Bienvenue! Bonjour! This is Lecture 17, and we are heading back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, back across the English Channel, uh, onto the continent of Europe, where we're going to be staying for the rest of the semester, because uh, the last two major figures on the syllabus, Rousseau and Marx, and also uh, Hegel too, whom we'll briefly mention uh, uh, next week or the week after, I can't remember now, uh, they're all continental European uh, uh, thinkers. Uh, but now we're considering uh, his, not his social contract, but his second discourse, his famous discourse on the origin of uh, inequality. Um, now, the arguments of the uh, social contract are certainly informed by the discourse, so I don't want to imply uh, at all that these uh, texts have nothing whatever to do with each other. Uh, that's certainly not the case. Uh, du contrat social is certainly a response to the problems that Rousseau uh, analyzes in uh, the second discourse. But the reason why I treat uh, the discourse on the origin of inequality separately from du contrat social in this course is that it seems to me that historically anyway, uh, uh, that discourse has a much broader significance uh, than just as a stepping stone or a prelude to uh, du contrat social. Uh, and the reason I think this is that uh, I think the discourse on the origin of inequality, of, of inequality uh, more or less single-handedly launches something that is new and distinctive in the modern West, uh, what I'm going to call the radical left critique uh, of modernity. Um, uh, and where du contrat social uh, uh, looks back in some ways to, although of course it's uh, rejecting too, uh, the classical social contract theories for Hobbes and Locke, I think the discourse on the origin of inequality looks forward and anticipates some leading themes uh, in Marx, and the radical left tradition in the West uh, more generally. So I'm going to spend the first part of uh, this uh, lecture saying just a little bit more about how I understand the modern radical left for the purposes of my presentation of Rousseau's uh, discourse. Of course, this comes with a health warning. Uh, anytime one uh, offers a kind of broad brush uh, view of what the radical left is, there are always going to be uh, uh, skeptics and critics who say, well, but what about this and what about that? And, and of course, I'm aware of that. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying a great deal here. And of course, uh, the radical left is a very, very complicated, fragmented, uh, variegated tradition, has lots of different limbs to it. Uh, so I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to uh, create the impression that there is really just one simple straight uh, line of argument in this tradition. But I do think that there is one central strand uh, that is uh, largely definitive of this uh, tradition. It's distinctively modern. It has uh, profoundly shaped uh, the left in the West. Uh, and I think Rousseau's discourse is a pioneering uh, and influential text in its founding. Indeed, I think it is the founding. It is, it, it is the sort of founding moment of this tradition. The main theme, the main idea, I think, uh, uh, behind the tradition I'm going to be talking about uh, is a fairly simple thought, it's simple to us, although I think you have to recognize that it was new uh, in the 18th century. Um, and it's the idea that it's imperative to try to expose unnoticed forms of oppression that hide behind conventional moral ideals and accepted dogmas. You know, the underlying thought is that oppression, domination, uh, uh, limitations on human freedom are not necessarily easy for us to notice, right? They hide, right? Uh, they're, they're fugitive, and, and you have to kind of dig them out. Right, uh, And the way to do that is to look past the conventional self-presentation of the existing order of things and try to understand uh, 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 and recognize them for what they are. Um, the word radical to us, you know, it, it carries connotations of extremism, uh, obstinacy, intransigence, a kind of uh, willful uh, provocativeness, uh, being out there, you know, determination to be contrarian. And that's not the meaning of radical that's uh, relevant here. And here it's worth thinking about the etymology of the word radical, which is from a Latin word simply for roots, as in, term, as in the roots of trees or the roots of plants, right? Um, uh, uh, it's the it's the word 
uh, that gives us the word radish, hence, hence the, the, the handsome little radish that's sitting on your slide uh, there. Uh, 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 the language of radicalism in that sense to do with roots, right, is connected to the left-wing tradition that uh, Rousseau initiates because historically uh, figures who've associated themselves with this tradition have thought of themselves as getting to the bottom of things, right, removing the delusions uh, that distort the way we understand our social situation uh, and looking more deeply, right, seeing through what's accepted, what's obvious, uh, what immediately strikes us, what's taken to be common sense, right, uh, and looking at the social world uh, not at a superficial level but at a deeper level. Um, uh, and that's the sense in which radical, uh, uh, the word radical is, 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 is pertinent uh, here. I think there's a connection here, I don't want to dwell too much on this, there's, there's a connection here with the aspirations of modern science, right? Uh, uh, modern scientists, as you know, you know, they love to point out how uh, ordinary ways of experiencing the world, uh, our everyday language of uh, motion and um, physical objects, um, actually, that's deeply misleading. And now that we've done a lot of physics, we, we, we've, we've understood that behind the appearances, there's something that is, in fact, uh, completely alien to ordinary experience. You know, I mean, you've all you've all experienced the, 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 the physicist who likes to say, well, you think that the table is solid, but actually there's all this space between these atoms and so forth. And, and the point there is we've seen more deeply into the nature of things uh, than you would if you just take uh, uh, superficial appearance is at face uh, value. Um, and I think that's not the only, but it's one of the important uh, influences uh, on the development of this radical left uh, tradition. I mean, the emphasis on science is certainly uh, less obvious in Rousseau. Rousseau is a little bit sort of um, uh, uh, on edge about science and, and the use of empirical reasoning and empirical investigation. But it is very clear in Marx, right? I mean, Marx certainly very often portrays himself uh, as a scientific analyst of social systems, um, and very much like the modern scientist, he likes to portray himself as someone who's seen through the surface appearances and understood the deeper laws of motion uh, that underlie human social practices and human history, right? Um, and implicit in that sort of appeal uh, is the thought that a deeper, more radical, in that sense, understanding uh, is a precondition for human uh, liberation. Um, we've already encountered some of the sort of constituent ingredient ideas of this in Francis Bacon, right? I mean, remember that short extract from the um, new organon that I um, uh, uh, assigned early in the course, uh, Bacon's uh, idols. These are you know, superficial appearances that we uh, are, are prone to uh, be, to, to which we're, we're prone to be seduced by them. Uh, and uh, the reason to do science, the reason to empirically investigate the world in a rigorous way is to try to liberate human beings from ignorance, from delusion, from complacent acceptance of what seems superficially obvious, right? We used to think that, uh, uh, the sun goes around the earth, right? And we've learned through doing better in, uh, uh, astronomical measurements, thanks to Copernicus and Galileo and Kepler and all these people, we've learned that's wrong. In fact, it's the other way around. We go around the sun, right? Um, it also liberates us from incapacity and weakness. By mastering technology, deploying ingenious technology, we can uh, uh, deploy uh, human powers to solve problems, overcome our weaknesses, uh, save ourselves labor, cure diseases, and so forth, right? So uh, implicit in all of this is the idea that science technology, scientific understanding uh, are, are vehicles of human liberation. And one can think of the radical left tradition that Rousseau launches as generalizing from this model of mental liberation uh, into practical social political affairs. Uh, whereas uh, uh, science, um, uh, uh, the sort of science that is studied in physics or biology, it's concerned primarily with exposing error in our empirical beliefs for its own sake, for satisfying our curiosity uh, about the world and how it's structured. Uh, the radical critique that I would associate with the tradition that Rousseau is launching is concerned less with empirical or epistemological beliefs about how the world is structured outside us um, and more with the kinds of illusions and beliefs and opinions uh, that oppress human beings uh, in various ways. So to go back to Bacon's famous 
uh, typology, it's going to be concerned much more with what he called the idols of the marketplace and the I idols of the theater, the way in which intellectual discourse or social intercourse uh, 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 launches and uh, propagates uh, ideologies and beliefs and uh, uh, forms of thinking uh, that are in fact uh, to the detriment uh, of our own uh, freedom. So whereas technology on the standard view seeks machines and devices that enhance existing human powers, the emphasis on the radical left is on restoring powers that human beings lose in the course of their social and political uh, evolution. And I think that's certainly true of Rousseau, it's certainly true of Marx. Let me mention um, uh, 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 a 20th century critical theorist uh, who's a kind of post-Marxist who it seems to me uh, just nailed the underlying idea uh, uh, very, very well. This is the German uh, critical theorist, Max Horkheimer. He writes in a famous essay, uh, the real social function of philosophy lies in its criticism of what is prevalent. The chief aim of such criticism is to prevent mankind from losing itself in those ideas and activities which the existing organization of society instills into its me members. And I think that's absolutely definitive uh, uh, and canonical uh, of the for the tradition that I'm trying to retrieve and in relation to which I'm triangulating uh, Rousseau. Notice that in uh, the account that Horkheimer and others uh, give, this idea of mankind losing itself is not understood straightforwardly as something that simply happens to us, right? It's not like diseases or pandemics or earthquakes, right? I mean, these are just external events. We don't really control them. They happen to us as part of the order of nature. Uh, it, it's not that we, we, you know, we don't create, I mean, you know, there are crazy conspiracy theorists who think that the Chinese caused COVID and so forth, no real evidence of this, right? But in general, diseases, pandemics, earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, th these things just happen to us. I mean, they're challenges, they're harmful and all the rest, and we need to try to prevent them, right? But, when, but they're not things that originate in us. But the phenomenon that Horkheimer and the wider radical left is, is concerned with, this phenomenon of mankind losing itself in what is prevalent, um, is concerned with something that human beings do to themselves, right? The origin of the kinds of problems that this tradition is concerned uh, to eliminate lies in us. It lies in the way we organize our society, the way we oppress ourselves, right? So it's man's inhumanity to man that is front and center in this uh, tradition. So notice on this sort of account, uh, oppressive delusion and domination, these are both the outcome of free human development, but at the same time, the limitation of our freedom and uh, potential, right? And you see this general theme sounded right at the very beginning of the discourse on the origin of inequality. Almost the first thing Rousseau says, I think the second full paragraph of the full text, once the prefaces, the, you know, the fawning um, uh, stuff about the, 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 the dedicatee and so forth, once you get all of that out of the way and we get into the full text of the discourse, uh, Rousseau says, look, my concern is within, is with moral, political, social inequality and privilege. And he distinguishes that phenomenon, which he says is his central concern, with natural inequality. And what he's saying there is, look, I'm not concerned with the fact that some of us are taller than others. I'm not concerned with the question of some people having greater talents than others or some people being more beautiful. Uh, than others. Those, those natural differences are real, um, and it's not a phenomenon I'm particularly concerned about here. What I'm concerned about is the conversion of those kinds of differences into artificially created forms of political domination, uh, uh, civic inequality, modes of privilege, forms of oppression that we ourselves create. And Rousseau says very clearly, and it's easy to miss because it's kind of a throwaway remark, but it's very, very important. Uh, Rousseau says these forms of uh, political inequality are introduced by consent, right? It's we who create them, right? And the implication here is that we are complicit in the systems of d domination and oppression uh, with which he and the wider le radical left tradition is concerned and from which we need to be emancipated. So in a way, he's saying we need to emancipate ourselves from ourselves. It's not that we need to be emancipated from nature or we need to be emancipated from some external threat. We need to look uh, closely at, at, at what we do to ourselves and how we are consenting 
uh, to uh, patterns of domination and oppression that are in principle eliminable uh, and whose elimination would enhance human potential and freedom. Let me mention a couple of other characteristic uh, radical left themes. These don't necessarily all apply to Rousseau, but they certainly, many of them apply uh, to Marx. Uh, a major mainstay of the radical left tradition, and certainly you see this in uh, Rousseau, is the idea that in order to uh, promote the sort of radical understanding, this, this sort of looking behind superficial appearances, uh, a major ally is historical understanding, right? The, the, the certain way of being superficial is to try to understand our social circumstances in its own terms, right? If you just stay within the local prejudices of your own society, right, you're not really going to understand it, right? Because the uh, conventional understandings of your own society have themselves uh, come from somewhere, right? And they are uh, uh, delusions very often. Um, and in, but in order to uh, uh, expose their illusory quality uh, and to see past them, uh, uh, the, the best, or at any rate, a good way of introducing greater uh, uh, critical distance is to understand something about how our mode of life developed uh, and what came before. So the thought here is that radical understanding uh, of the present requires an understanding of it in the light of its past. How did we get to where we are now, uh, given where we came from? Why have we constructed society this way when before we used to construct it this way? Um, uh, and that will enable us, the thought is, to better diagnose uh, and more independently understand uh, the actual shape uh, of the current order of things and why we might want to uh, improve or modify uh, them. Another characteristic theme, uh, this is probably uh, uh, more explicit in Marx than it is in Rousseau, but I think it's certainly embryonic in Rousseau, is the thought that the history of the human species, a free and rational species, is a history of self-limitation and then uh, of its overcoming the resulting limitations, right? Uh, so implicit in this is the idea that the history of the human species is human freedom, both expressing itself in a certain kind of way and then discovering that it has to overcome the obstacles and impediments that it has itself created. So human freedom is, in a way, a struggle against itself. And one way to think about this in relation to what we've read before is to think of it as radicalizing uh, uh, Hobbes's fundamental insight announced right at the very beginning of Leviathan, right? You remember, Hobbes says you've got to think about the state as artificial. The state is not natural, it's not supernatural, it's something human beings contrive. And what he's saying there is uh, that the state, which is of course what he's talking about, uh, is not something that is just given, but rather something that human beings participate in creation, in creating. And, and of course Hobbes is using that kind of insight as a way to apologize for one of these systems, namely the modern sovereign state. He's trying to say, well, once you understand that the modern sovereign state is a social construction, I think I can show you why it's rational for you to continue to participate in upholding it, right? And what kind of rational stake you have uh, in, its, in its existence. And basically the radical left tradition that Rousseau um, initiates uh, is radicalizing and in a way subverting that thought, right? Uh, he accepts, as do most of the radical left thinkers in the tradition, um, that indeed systems of power are artificial social constructions, right? Uh, but instead of uh, uh, adopting a kind of uh, presumption of uh, apology towards them, a, a, a presumptively apologetic uh, attitude to them and trying to explain why it's rational for us to accept them, uh, the radical left approach is to say, well, precisely because they're socially constructed, we need to pay very, very close attention to them and make sure that they're not actually vehicles for our own self-limitation, right? Uh, so in that sense, Rousseau begins this uh, way of thinking about our social world that sometimes travels over the, under this uh, rather pretentious uh, label, the hermeneutics of suspicion. Hermeneutics is just a fancy word for interpretation, right? But it's suspicion that is the important word, right? The thought is, once you grasp the basic idea that the systems of power under which we live 
are socially constructed, they're artificial contrivances, we should immediately be suspicious of them. And we should resist the Hobbesian impulse uh, to regard their existence as a sign of their rationality uh, or of their freedom-enhancing potential. That's the wrong presumption to uh, uh, operate under. You should rather operate under the uh, uh, assumption of uh, suspicion. You should think, well, if they're socially created, they're probably vehicles for the domination of some by others, right? And that's what we need to try to expose in the name of freedom. Um, another theme, again, not so clear in Rousseau, but it's very going to be very important for Marx, but I'll mention it now. Uh, it's characteristic, I think, for the left, uh, radical left tradition I'm talking about here uh, to reject utopianism. Um, and this may come as a surprise to you because, of course, many uh, uh, radical left thinkers, including Marx himself, are often complacently thought of as utopians, right? As dreaming of some, you know, fantasy future, some ideal society that is completely unfeasible and unworkable and so forth. And certainly there are figures whom one would want to describe as on the left, who've indulged that kind of utopian thinking. But I think what's most striking about at least the tradition that you see Rousseau initiating um, and that Marx represents, what I think is most striking is a profound uh, hostility to utopianism of, of that sort. When you get to Marx's uh, Communist Manifesto, you'll see him spending a whole section criticizing utopian socialists. Um, and the, the, the charge that figures like Marx and to a degree Rousseau and others in the radical tradition make against the utopians is that they're not sufficiently realist, right? They're, they're distracting attention away from what we need to be thinking about, which is what are the actual patterns of oppression that are on the ground now and how should we diagnose them? And they're sort of fantasizing about a kind of ideal world in which none of these phenomena really exist. It's a little bit like you'll remember in uh, Du Contat Social in the chapter on civil religion, uh, Rousseau says, uh, criticizing conventional theism, right? Well, the problem with conventional Christian theism is that it's constantly fixated on the afterlife, right? It's ignoring all of the problems of life in, in, in the here and now, right? And, and treating earthly existence with a kind of contempt, um, and instead investing all of the psychic en energy in fantasizing about uh, a, a supernatural future in, in, in an afterlife, in, in thinking about heaven and our reconciliation with God. And, and Rousseau thinks, well, look, that's, that, that's unhelpful because all it does is to distract attention away from the here and now, away from the human problems that face us now, um, and encourages us to engage in a kind of aestheticization of some kind of utopian castle in the air, which we'll never achieve. And that is not a good way on the standard uh, radical left approach. That's not a good way uh, to help liberate people. Rather, it's just a way of um, uh, actually anesthetizing the dispositions that you need uh, to recognize uh, uh, the oppressions under which we live. That's why, of course, Marx famously calls uh, religion, the opiate of the pe people, right? It's, it, it's, it's, an, it's an opium. It's a, it, it's a drug that basically anesthetizes and numbs people to the existence uh, of suffering, uh, oppression, and domination. And that's what we need to wake people out of. And to do that, you need to not be utopian. You need to be realist. Um, and again, historical understanding is, for many of these figures, the way to uh, 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 be suitably uh, realist in this, in this sense. Uh, I think it's also worth uh, noting that in this tradition, freedom is typically understood as uh, the uh, uh, power to remove uh, self-imposed limitations uh, on human potential. Um, and conversely, a characteristic uh, understanding of unfreedom in this tradition uh, is that people are unfree when they find themselves subjected to or oppressed by powers that serve the needs of something alien to them, something that is not them, right? It might be a system, might be some set of institutions, it might be a tradition, it might be some religious idol or a god, or some kind of inauthentic understanding of what you're supposed to be, right? Uh, uh, this is clearly in Rousseau, but of course it's also very clearly in uh, Marx, who has a whole category, uh, alienation, which I'll talk about in the coming weeks, that kind of captures this distinctive kind of uh, unfreedom. Uh, but I want to flag it now because I think you can fairly clearly see in an embryonic uh, form uh, 
uh, this theme of alienation in Rousseau, even though he doesn't actually use that language. Uh, turning to Rousseau's discourse itself, um, I mean, you, you, you can, I think, already see this. I don't want to labor these points. They're, they're fairly straightforward. Um, obviously, Rousseau is uh, an Enlightenment thinker, but he stands apart from the main line of the Enlightenment because uh, he wants to turn Enlightenment criticism against some of the prejudices that he thinks uh, the Enlightenment thinkers themselves propounded, right? Uh, so uh, uh, his target uh, is uh, the standard Enlightenment narrative of human history as a story of progressive and more or less remorseless inevitable improvement uh, and gradual liberation. Uh, Rousseau says that's a naive and superficial way to understand the story of uh, the the species. It's not that the Enlightenment narrative is entirely false, right? It's certainly true that in certain respects, human beings are much more enlightened, in many ways even much more moral, uh, in many ways less deluded, and in some respects more free than they were uh, before. Uh, it's not that the Enlightenment story about the enhancement of latent human capacities is a complete pack of lies. He wants to concede to some extent it's true, but he wants to say that just accepting that side of the story is superficial. Uh, the facts are somewhat more inconvenient because, and this is one of the things he tries to do in the discourse, um, he thinks that when you look more closely, you'll discover that this uh, process of progressive liberation has also had a downside. And that downside has been itself to the detriment of human freedom itself, right? So, you know, his implicit picture of history is as a kind of three steps forward, two, maybe four steps back kind of, you know, it's, it's not a straightforward linear uh, 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 progression in which everything just gets better and better and better. It's rather that, uh, yes, we improve ourselves in certain directions, we emphasize certain problems, and maybe we even solve some of those problems. But in solving some of those problems, we create new ones um, and these become new limitations on human freedom that we need to, to struggle to understand and eventually uh, eliminate. But in order to be able to understand them correctly, you have to see them for what, you, for what they are. And the problem, he thinks, with the standard Enlightenment story of inevitable liberation and progress is that it tends to hide uh, those challenges from view and to encourage a kind of complacent, well, everything's going to get better and better and better, so we don't need to worry about uh, any, further, any further problems, right? That, that's complacent, Rousseau thinks, uh, and the kind of argument that he offers in the discourse is an attempt to push back against that complacency and expose to view uh, some of the costs of uh, the progress of the species in, 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 the, civilized, in, in the civilized period. To do this, as you know, the discourse on the origin of inequality takes up some of the themes of classical social contract theory as we found them, for example, in Hobbes and Locke, and then parodies them. Why does he start there? Well, I think the reason is something like the following, right? Uh, Rousseau thinks that Hobbes and Locke purport to uh, assess the value of the modern state uh, uh, from some position of critical independence and detachment, right? They purport to legitimate the extant structure of social power and especially the modern state uh, from some independent, detached, uh, critically impartial standpoint. But Rousseau is not convinced that they've succeeded in really achieving genuine independence, critical independence, from the social institutions that they're trying to criticize and understand. Because, Rousseau complains, all they do is simply generalize and project into their states of nature patterns of behavior that are already baked into the social institutions that they're trying to defend, right? Um, so there's a kind of status quo bias built into the Hobbesian, Lockean social contract uh, theory. Right? It's not that Rousseau thinks Hobbes and Locke are incorrect to notice that human beings are often uh, uh, obsessed by the desire to secure themselves. It's not that they're constantly anxious about their, their junk being stolen from them. 
It's not that they're not acquisitive. It's not that they're uh, 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 not on edge uh, uh, about their livelihoods being uh, undermined, right? That is indeed uh, uh, how human beings are. But that's how they are in the 17th and 18th and also, of course, the 20th century, right? Uh, that's not necessarily how we really are. That's likely, or at least it's possible, that we uh, present ourselves to each other in that way because we've been socialized to be that way by the very institutions that Hobbes and Locke are seeking to defend, right? So part of the worry here is that Hobbes and Locke are kind of reasoning in a circle, right? Uh, that they're, they're, they're saying, well, what justifies the state, right? And they're claiming to repair to an independent standpoint that they call the state of nature, but then they're imputing into the state of nature all kinds of dispositions, motives, patterns, and behavior that might, for all we know, simply be symptoms of living under a modern state, right? Um, and if that's the case, then they're not really uh, achieving any genuine critical independence from uh, the institution of the modern state. They're presupposing the modern state and its effect on human motivation right from the beginning. So, the whole, so, so his worry about this is that uh, there are assumptions being built into the classical social contract theory that are themselves part of the phenomena on which we need to get a certain critical distance. Um, and if Rousseau is right, the state of nature, as the classical social contract theorists um, described it, is contaminated by assumptions that themselves need independent examination uh, and critical scrutiny. And part of what he wants to do in the discourse uh, is to uh, expose those underlying assumptions uh, to critical view. And in order to do this, he thinks, uh, you have to, uh, uh, yes, continue to use the state of nature idea, but you need to radicalize it. And you need to project the state of nature back far deeper uh, into human history than anything that you get in Hobbes and Locke. Because as I've already said, all Hobbes and Locke do is that they kind of hold human uh, dispositions and behavior constant, and then simply remove from the picture analytically the institution of the modern state. They simply take that out of the picture and then they say, well, if we got rid of this, what would we be like? Uh, well, we would be, you know, in this state of insecurity in the state of nature. And so we'd need something to solve that problem. So we would buy into the state. So they, they just plug the state back in, right? And that doesn't satisfy Rousseau because he's not prepared to just accept without further argumentation that the state of nature that they are describing uh, genuinely represents a, a, a standpoint of critical detachment from which we can fairly represent what human beings have lost and gained uh, in the socializing process, which of course has led up to institutions like uh, the modern state, right? So that's the main move that Rousseau wants to make here and why that's why he focuses on uh, the social contract theory and why he parodies and in a way radicalizes their idea of the state of nature. So the state of nature in the discourse is not just the subtraction of the state uh, from human relations and human dispositions and um, human propensities held constant, right? For Rousseau, the state of nature is a much more radical conjecture about what human life would have been like before any culture or civilization uh, has evolved. So he's asking us to go much, much further back, as it were, uh, in order to gain critical distance on uh, the present. Um, so he asks us to imagine in the discourse, in part one anyway, uh, uh, human beings as they would have been uh, long before any complex or elaborate culture or civilization has evolved, just as a distinctive biological species among many, as if we've, as it were, just split off from whatever group of primates, Homo sapiens, uh, initially appeared, right? That, that's, for him, the appropriate point of origin. And by speculating about what human beings would have been like at that stage, he thinks, we will be more entitled to say that we can understand in a more critically detached way uh, the, the form of life that we currently inhabit, right? That's the move he wants to make. There's a fantastic poem uh, by Thomas Hardy, um, whose first two stanzas, the poem is called Before Life and After, uh, whose first two stanzas seem to me to more or less perfectly capture uh, Rousseau's basic picture of the state of nature. Here's the poem. A time there was, as one may guess, and as indeed Earth's testimonies tell, 
before the birth of consciousness, when all went well. None suffered sickness, love, or loss. None knew regret, starved hope, or heart burnings. None cared whatever crash or cross brought rack to things. Now, you could quibble about, you know, a couple of clauses here or there, but I think this is essentially Rousseau's view of man in the state of nature. Because uh, Rousseau's noble savage, to use a term he never uses, but, you know, th th this has become part of the standard sort of way of talking about Rousseau, so I will occasionally use that. Um, Rousseau's noble savage is completely pre-linguistic, and in that sense, pre-conscious, right? Because lacking language, lacking any kind of categories uh, or, or forms of thought that would allow him or her to sort of uh, uh, categorize things and classify things according to concepts of any kind, um, his noble savage, in a sense, has absolutely no sense of self whatsoever. Um, uh, so, so in that sense, natural man is for Rousseau completely pre-conscious. There's no sort of self-awareness uh, uh, because there's no language, no set of concepts on which any such self-consciousness could, could have hang itself, right? That's not to say, of course, that Rousseau's noble savage is pre-sentient, right? Of course, his noble savage is capable of pleasure and pain, um, and he or she is activated by instincts of one sort or another, various uh, drives and needs that are relatively easily sated uh, by the natural environment, right? In, in, in the state of nature, resources are relatively superabundant uh, relative to human basic, humans' basic needs. Um, uh, and he, he says that in this situation, you know, we will simply be subject only to these relatively mild and moderate and easily satiated drives and needs, right? We'll need some food, we'll need some food, we'll need some drink, uh, we may have the urge for sex, and of course, you know, the things he has to say about sex are very, very sexist and problematic, so if you pick that up, that up in the text, it's not your fault, it's really there, that these are, these are, these are not passages that were Rousseau's uh, finest hour, but you get the general idea, right, in, 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 in the natural state, uh, human beings have very limited and easily sated uh, natural drives uh, uh, and needs. Um, and when, he, when individuals in his state of nature satisfy these needs, Rousseau is prepared to say, well, there's a sense in which they are motivated by self-interest, uh, but that self-interest is completely unselfconscious. It's what he simply calls amour de soi. Amour, of course, is the French word for love. And when he calls it amour, amour de soi, he's saying it's a kind of self-love, right? It's a kind of self-interest, right? And, and, but, it, but, but there's nothing conscious about it. It's just that, you know, I have an urge to drink, and so I get up off the ground, and I go to the, to the creek, and I, and, I, and I slake my thirst, right? Um, that uh, innocent uh, self-love, that unselfconscious self-love, is, Rousseau says in a way that's going to be very important for his later argument in the discourse, um, is to some extent um, moderated by uh, an additional uh, instinct, which Rousseau postulates uh, even uh, man in the most primitive state uh, would have been moved by, which is the sentiment of pitié, which is related, it goes back to something I talked about with Hume uh, a few weeks ago. Um, it's this idea that human beings, are they have a natural instinct to sympathize with the suffering of others, right? So if I see an animal that's hurt, uh, in, in the state of nature, I'll probably come to its aid, right? And this is important because uh, part of what Rousseau is getting across is that he thinks that uh, the desire to be vindictive, the, de the desire to be violent, the desire to be cruel for its own sake, and to take pleasure in another person's suffering, right? That's something that he's going to say, we have to learn. And of course, it's something that he thinks civilization teaches us. And this is one of the big trade-offs, right? His innocent noble savage uh, won't be motivated to inflict vindictive cruelty and pain on others uh, because he just doesn't have any of the sort of self-consciousness that would allow any of those dispositions uh, to develop at all. If he has an attitude uh, to the suffering of others, it's going to be this attitude of pitié, right? If, it, if, he, if he finds uh, uh, somebody suffering or an animal suffering, he'll do what he can uh, or she can to, to assist it, right? Um, and, and part of what he's getting across here is that he thinks this innocent amour de soi and pitié would be in a kind of natural balance. They would harmonize with each other, right? We'd be basically self-interested in a totally unselfconscious way. Uh, but since we wouldn't have any desire to inflict cruelty on others for its own sake, 
and indeed would do certain things to come to other people's aid when they're in distress, um, our amour de soi would also not lead us to be in any fundamental way at odds with each other. Uh, these two uh, sentiments kind of balance and moderate each other, um, and partiality to self, unselfconscious partiality to self, would coexist with a natural sympathy uh, to sympathize with the suffering uh, of others. And as I've said, without any language, we lack any abstract categories or higher cognition. Um, nevertheless, uh, Rousseau thinks there are two latent capacities that are distinctively human, that are residually present in the human species. I mean, when he says this, he means these distinguish human beings from the rest of the animal uh, kingdom. I mean, we're like the rest of the animal kingdom in lots of ways. Uh, uh, but in these two respects, we are unlike. The rest of the animal kingdom, but these two distinctive capacities are completely dormant in his state of mind. They haven't been in any way elicited or recruited or deployed. They're just residually present. They're just latent. Uh, uh, it, it, they, they, they become important in the historical story only later when they're recruited in various ways uh, by the civilizing uh, process, but it's important to understand what they are. There is, first of all, he thinks, uh, the capacity for, uh, for free will, the capacity to step back uh, and resist our instincts, not be completely driven uh, by the appetites and aversions uh, that immediately uh, move us, right? Uh, human beings, he thinks, have some capacity to choose whether to accede to the promptings of their appetites and appetites. And that gives them some independence of action. He doesn't talk about how this is possible at any great length, and he doesn't get into, you know, metaphysical arguments about what this free will looks like. Of course, you know, Hobbes famously denied that there's uh, such a thing, and he's clearly taking an anti-Hobbesian uh, position, and this is connected, as you will remember, to some of what he says about independence and freedom of the will uh, in Du Contrat Social. But at any rate, even though it has no real relevance in his state of nature, it's purely dormant, it's just a, a latent capacity, he thinks it is, in principle, there, waiting uh, to be brought to life uh, and, and developed in uh, uh, social life later in the course of human development. Uh, the other is this faculty that he calls the capacity of perfectibility. Um, and what he means here is the capacity, which again he thinks is distinctive to human beings, to set evaluative standards, right, to recognize certain things as being better or worse, or to rank them as superior or inferior relative to some standard of performance or some criterion of value or some standard of worth, right? Um, and furthermore, the capacity to judge oneself and others relative to that kind of standard, right? Which then, of course, uh, gives human beings the possibility of holding themselves up to some such standard and seeking to improve themselves, right? You know, so the, 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 the golfer who goes out every weekend to try to improve her handicap, right? Uh, setting herself, I mean, par on a golf course, that's, a, that's for uh, Rousseau, that would be the kind of, uh, that would be an example of the faculty of perfectibility uh, in operation, right? We have a, a capacity to set ourselves a standard. Okay, so what's the par on this hole? It's a par five. That means my goal is, right, to try to uh, uh, beat, uh, secure par or, or beat par, right? Um, and when I do that, I'm setting myself a standard, get the ball in the hole in five shots or less, right? And the hope is, of course, that as I get better and better at golf, I will gradually improve and I might be able to get on the green in two on a par five and, and, and get a birdie or maybe even an eagle, right? Um, and that's the faculty of perfectibility in operation for Rousseau. And again, that's of no relevance at all in the state of nature because that, that faculty is completely incipient in uh, natural man in the state of nature. It hasn't been in any way activated, but he does think that it's there latently and will, of course, play a fateful role in the story he tells about our degradation and corruption uh, under civilized uh, conditions. Rousseau admits uh, near the beginning of uh, the discourse that his account of this uh, uh, natural state, the state of nature, is entirely conjectural and is not in any way decisively supported by scientific evidence. But he says 
that doesn't matter. Indeed, he says something even stronger. He says, let's set aside the facts because they have no bearing on the matter. Um, and you might say, well, that's a weird thing to say. I mean, what, what then is the status of all of this? If it's just Rousseau's conjectural speculations, what probative force do they have? Why on earth should we care about this man's idle speculations about what human life would have been like? Um, and I think um, uh, there are a couple of things to say about this, and I'll end this lecture here. Um, I think it's very important to see that, I mean, Rousseau doesn't really, I mean, when he says, let's set the fact aside, that, 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 that's an exaggeration because he, in fact, does appeal to uh, some evidence. I think it's important to see that Rousseau is not saying here uh, that his account of the state of nature is some kind of lie or a fiction, right? Uh, the, the right way to think of this, I submit, is to notice a certain latent Hobbesian influence in his approach. Remember, uh, uh, that uh, I depicted Hobbes in the early moves in, Le in Leviathan as holding his account of human motivation up to a test of honest introspection. And he's saying, look inside yourself and ask, can you decisively rule this out? Is there anything in the uh, uh, stipulations that I'm giving about your motivation that conflicts decisively with your everyday experience? If not, then you're in a position to basically grant the premises from which I'm arguing. And, and I think that's the right way to think about Rousseau, uh, Rousseau's procedure in the discourse too, right? He supposes that such evidence as we do possess won't in any way falsify his hypothesis. And in fact, as I've said, he does occasionally cite evidence. And if you look at the extensive footnotes to both part one and part two, you'll, you'll find uh, occasional references to you know uh, anthropological findings such as they were of course in the 18th century I mean there wasn't wasn't a science of anthropology but of course there are explorers who come back and, and tell us stories uh, of of uh, uh, societies uh, that have yet to be uh, that have developed in a very different direction from European civilization uh, uh, tribes and and uh, uh, native uh, Aboriginal pe peoples in other parts of the of, of, of the world that organize themselves in comparatively rudimentary uh, uh, ways. So so he, he thinks there's at least some circumstantial evidence supporting this. Um, but his main point is that the real test is to look inside yourself and ask whether this resonates with your introspection. And if that uh, and no other external facts contradict this, uh, then there's good reason to think that my speculations uh, are important and on uh, target. Remember that, you know, for him, the point of going back further in human history than anything that Locke and Hobbes had envisaged is to help Rousseau to do the following, to discriminate between those motives that he's going to say are merely artifacts of our later socialization, uh, uh, motives that, of course, he's going to go on to say, and I'll talk about this in the next lecture, are vain, inauthentic, narcissistic, self-absorbed and problematic in all sorts of ways, slavish, uh, indeed. He, he wants to find a way to discriminate between those motives that we can learn to recognize as merely artifacts of our socialization and therefore not necessarily representing the authentic me or the authentic you, um, and those motives and emotions that are more authentically yours, but that you've uh, forgotten or lost touch with uh, or been encouraged to lose contact with because of the way you've been uh, corrupted and socialized by civilized institutions. So uh, what he's trying to do here is to try to recover um, and put you in touch with uh, an authentic humanity that he thinks has been obscured by layers of discipline and civilized reprogramming that goes on during the, um, the civilizing program, process. It's very much like a kind of psychological introspective archaeology, right? He's, he's trying to get you to look through, uh, use, using this fable of uh, the state of nature, he's trying to get you to look beyond uh, motives uh, that may well have been socialized into you by the powers that be, uh, under your current condition um, and try to put you in touch with something deeper inside yourself uh, that will resonate emotionally with you, right? Um, uh, in some ways, I don't want to make too much of this, uh, this foreshadows the kind of psychotherapeutic techniques uh, that Freud pioneered and which, which are, you know, the stock in trade of a wide variety of uh, uh, psychiatric uh, talk therapies uh, 
uh, since uh, Freud, right? I mean, in the Freudian story, you know, what you do is you're, you're, you've got some neurosis, you're try, you're, you have a difficulty in your life, you're, you're uh, depressed or uh, you're thinking of, of, about killing yourself or you've got some psychological problem. What's the solution, Freud says? Well, the solution is to try to understand how it is that you've acquired the habits of thought that materialize now as depressive self-accusation. And one way to do that is to kind of regress back and reconstruct an account of especially your early years, your relations with your parents, your relations with your society, how you developed certain ingrained patterns of thought so that you can better understand how, the, how those acquired habits of thought are in fact unhealthy and causing you psychological difficulties and inhibitions uh, of various sorts. And the thought is that by understanding how these uh, dispositions developed, we can emancipate ourselves from some of the, the psychological pathologies that um, uh, uh, arrive later and that are causing us difficulty now. I think there's a sense in which uh, Rousseau is trying to do something rather similar to that, um, except that it's not really individual psychology, it's the kind of collective uh, uh, socialization of the species that he's concerned about. And the point of his honest introspection about the noble savage is he's trying to put yourself back in touch with something that he thinks is authentic to your humanity, but which the forces of civilization have tried desperately to repress. And the point is to try to uh, uh, put you back in touch with them, de-repress them, emancipate them, and that then will enable us to uh, put critical pressure uh, on the existing way of organizing things that we would might otherwise take for granted. Right? So that's what he's doing. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, that's enough for today. Uh, um, see you all soon. Thank you.